Hello, and welcome to this Mage.com custom webcast titled Optimizing Sensitivity and Specificity in the RT QIC assay using BMG plate readers. My name is Jay Shan Carpen, and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by BMG LabTech, a leading global developer and manufacturer of innovative, high quality, and reliable microplate reader instrumentation. We'll begin today's webcast with presentations from two speakers and end with a Q&A session where we will address the questions that have been submitted by you. To ask a question, just press the Ask a Question button at any point during the webcast and we will answer them today. The first speaker is Dr. Carl Peters, who is a microplate reader, senior application scientist with BMG LabTech. Over to Carl. Hello, I am Carl Peters from BMG LabTech. I would like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today for what will be a very informative webinar. I know that we all want to get to see what Davin has to say about the RT Quick Assay, but by way of introduction, I would like to present some background on the microplate reader that will be featured in this webinar. Today, we will be talking about the Omega series of microplate readers. This series is the most cost-effective among our multi-mode microplate readers, and can be equipped to perform absorbance, luminescence, or fluorescence intensity assays, or it can be equipped with any combination of these detection capabilities. For the assay we will be talking about today, our focus will be on fluorescence intensity assays. The Omega readers exhibit good sensitivity at an LOD of 200 atomol per well for fluorescein, and can read plates quite quickly with a read time for a 384 well plate of as little as 16 seconds. Shown here are two depictions of how we understand the phenomenon of fluorescence to occur. Detection of fluorescence intensity is based on the fact that certain molecules, called fluorophores, when sp exposed to specific wavelengths of light, are able to temporarily change to a higher energy state. As they return to the ground state, they lose the energy in the form of heat and emission of light that is of a higher wavelength than the excitation light. The fluorophore we will be featuring in today's webinar is thioflavin T. This molecule is well characterized for the increase in fluorescent signal it exhibits when it binds to beta-rich structures of certain protein multimers. The left-hand figure shows a representation of the increase in fluorescence that can be observed during fibril formation, in this case for amyloid fibrils of A-beta. The binding of thioflavin T to beta sheets has been the subject of some scholarly investigation. A 2009 paper proposed the model shown on the right as the most energetically favorable minimum binding site for thioflavin T. The minim minimum needs for performing these types of aggregation assays is a means of detecting the fluorescence change, so a light source, filters to select excitation and emission light, and a means of detecting the amount of light that is produced. Additional features that have proven useful are the ability to read from the bottom of the plate, the ability to regulate temperature, and the ability to perform shaking at high speeds. To provide the excitation light, the Omega uses a xenon flash lamp. This provides consistent energy across a quite broad spectrum as shown in the graph. Furthermore, this is very reproducible from flash to flash and the excitation source has a long lifetime of several years. BMG has worked with our customers to find appropriate filter combinations for a wide variety of assays, and of course for the assay that we were talking about today using thioflavin T. For the Omega, these filters can be used in top or bottom reading. Bottom reading for the RT quick assay is important due to the fact that plates are sealed during their time in the plate reader which can be up to 72 hours. The final basic need for performing thioflavin T assays is achieved in the Omega with a photomultiplier tube for sensitive detection of emission light. The ability to control temperature appears to be quite important in the RT quick assay, and BMG has standard temperature regulation up to 45 degrees Celsius in all our readers or you can choose optional extended incubation up to 65 degrees. Another important factor in successful RT quick assays is robust shaking. 
The transport system of the Omega appears to be quite well suited to this task. As it became apparent to BMG that the RT Quick assay was very important among a segment of our customers, we sought their input as to how we might be better. Thus far, we have implemented two important changes we think will be advantageous. When the RT Quick assay was originally designed, it required no small amount of ingenuity. To achieve the required shaking, a protocol distinct from that used to detect changes in thioflavin T signal was needed. Then these two protocols were run repeatedly using BMG's scripting capability. Although the approach using a script has been extremely successful, we thought it would be better if it was not required. To make a one protocol approach possible, we changed the shaking capabilities on the Omega such that you can now perform a shaking action whenever the plate is not being read. The shaking can be constant, but can also be cycled on and off. During the robust shaking of the plate during the RT Quick assay, the possibility of a plate coming off the plate carrier was identified as a concern. To address this possible problem, BMG can now provide a plate carrier with clips that are designed to hold the plate more securely when the plate is pressed firmly into the carrier. These clips can easily be removed if you so choose. In closing, I would like to thank our engineers for designing the Omega as such a robust platform. Although it was not designed for RT Quick, it seems quite well suited to the task. They have also been instrumental in implementing the changes that we think will be helpful to RT Quick users. Thank you again for your attendance at this webinar. Thanks, Carl. The second speaker today is Dr. Davin Henderson of the Colorado State University. Over to Davin. Hi, my name is Davin Henderson. I'm a researcher at Colorado State University. I've been working in the prion field for over five years, and during that time I've been utilizing the RT Quick assay to answer some really great questions about prion research. Today my talk is going to focus on a few basic principles of RT Quick. The first, I'm going to talk about amyloid amplification and how that relates to the RT Quick assay. I'm going to talk about data display and simplification using lag phase. I'm going to talk about important factors in the RT Quick assay and how to determine optimal RT quick conditions. Detection of amyloid by seeded amplification is a lot like what happens in vivo in the disease process. There are two types of prion diseases that animals or humans could get. Uh, one is a spontaneous disease where a PRP monomer misfolds and forms a nucleation event, and that nucleation event could then propagate to form amyloid filaments. And this process is rare and not favored in vivo. Um, another type of disease a person or animal could acquire is a seeded amyloid event where someone acquires a prion, an amyloid seed, and that seed recruits more monomer and forms amyloid filament, and that amyloid filament goes on to infect more cells. That process is more rapid, and those disease courses are significantly shorter. So in the RT quick assay, there are, those same two reactions occur. There is a potential for an unseeded reaction to occur and a potential for the seeded reaction to occur. And in RT Quick, we want to limit the unseeded amyloid formation reaction. And that happens when this PRP monomer forms this nucleation, and that nucleation is then propagated on to be an amyloid filament. And in order to limit that reaction, we use things like particular pHs, salt concentrations, or SDS concentrations, which will limit that spontaneous or unseeded reaction from happening. However, some of the same conditions which affect unseeded amyloid formation also affect seeded conversion. So we don't want to limit the formation of amyloid too much, otherwise the, the reaction won't continue uh, in a rapid fashion or in, in a sensitive fashion. So I'll talk a little bit more about the particular conditions that lead to limiting un, unseeded amyloid formation and encouraging seeded formation in later slides. There's another really important aspect to the RT quick assay, and that's the fragmentation of amyloid filaments, which lead to more free ends for increased amplification. And this is what leads to the logarithmic amplification of amyloid in the RT quick assay, as well as other amyloid amplifying, amplifying assays that use either shaking or sonication. During the RT quick assay, there are two phases. There is an amplification phase where the PRP monomer substrate is adding on to the ends of the amyloid filaments and that's when the plate is at rest. And that is alternated by shaking, and that 
during that shaking process, the amyloid filaments are broken, like I said, and those new free ends are what allows this assay to be really amenable to a rapid time scale. We have certain seeds that are positive in less than four hours in the RT quick assay, which is an amazing feat to amyl amplify that much amyloid. So after fragmentation, more monomer adds on to the ends of each one of those amyloid filaments and until a point where there's enough amyloid present that the thioflavin T dye could recognize it. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about specifically how the RT quick assay works with uh, the real-time readout and what the raw data looks like for the RT quick assay. So in the RT quick assay, there's a reaction buffer which contains the alpha helical recombinant PRP and typically in our lab we use the Syrian hamster recombinant PRP that's residues 90 to 231 so that's the truncated form of the Syrian hamster protein. We found that to be really versatile for a number of different seed substrates and a number of different um, uh, species of animals that we test using this substrate. So that is the major component of the reaction buffer is the recombinant PRP protein. And to that, a seed is added, and that seed either contains or does not contain a prion. And that prion is in an amyloid conformation, which is capable of converting the alpha helical recombinant PRP to the amyloid form of the protein. Now, in that buffer is also a dye called thioflavin T, which I've mentioned before. Thioflavin T binds to amyloid filaments and has a shift in fluorescence once bound. So that is what allows us to detect the presence of prions in real time. So once the alpha T begins to fluoresce, then we know the reaction has started. And from that point, the reaction is typically logarithmic. So those thioflavin and T positive amyloid filaments will then fragment, and then more recombinant alpha helical protein will add onto the ends of those, creating more filaments, which are also thioflavin and T positive. And below, you can see some traces from our Syrian hamster recombinant substrate where we had seeded reactions occur. And as the reaction goes along, the thioflavin T fluorescence on the y-axis is very low until um, the amyloid is present at a high enough level for it to be detected. And then we see the logarithmic amplification of the substrate until the substrate is consumed, and that's when the line levels off. The RT quick assay is extraordinarily versatile. We've used the many different substrates in order to detect many different types of prions. We predominantly use the Syrian hamster truncated form, the 90 to 231, like I said, but we've also used substrates like the white-tailed deer substrate, which is equivalent to the Syrian hamster truncated substrate because we work on CWD in our lab. We've also used full-length white-tailed deer and full-length elk, which only differ at a single residue to try and determine if those are individually different. We've also used feline substrate to detect FSE. We've used full-length bovine substrate and full-length human substrate. And with these substrates, we've been able to detect prions in CWD, Scrapey, uh, BSE, FSE, feline CWD, and CJD. We've also used the R2 quick assay to detect prions in a whole bunch of different types of tissues and bodily fluids. Brain is the easiest tissue to detect prions in since it has the highest concentrations that we've found. With CWD, we also see really high levels in the lymphatic tissue, uh, almost comparable to what we see in brain. We've also used the RT quick assay to detect prions in lots of different bodily fluids like saliva and urine. We've also used CSF or cell culture lysates, nasal swabs, as well as a whole bunch of other tissues which are typically positive in CWD, which may not be positive in other prion diseases, but since CWD is such a peripheralizing prion disease, it is present in a lot of parts of the deer that we look at. There are a lot of advantages to the RT quick assay compared to some of the other amyloid amplifying assays that uh, people use to study prion diseases. The RT quick assay occurs in a 96 well plate, which makes it a high throughput assay, which is amenable to automation. The RT quick assay is also really sensitive. It's about 10,000 fold more sensitive than Western Blot or ELISA. Um, also, the data is in real time, so you don't have to necessarily run the assay for 60 hours and not know what happened. You can look at it at 24 hours to see how things are going, and if something looks strange, then you could stop it and start over again. Um, that's not really the case with some of the other assays where the readout is Western Blot, for example. The R2 quick assay is also very easy to vary the substrates. It just depends which one you express or purify from E. coli, uh, which one you want to use. And that makes it adaptable to a, a huge number of different prion diseases from different animals. It's also really rapidly optimized because of the 96 well plate format. I'm going to talk a little bit more later about how best to optimize the RT quick assay. In the literature, there's been a number of ways people have chosen to display RT quick data. The most common way that I've seen is the raw thioflavin T traces of the fluorescence, and 
this is a good way to visualize what's going on in the assay, but what, it, what becomes difficult is displaying a lot of data on one graph. So we've moved to a slightly different approach where we look at the lag phase or the time to threshold, which is similar to an RT-PCR value, where the threshold is defined as the average value of the baseline fluorescence times five standard deviations. So when a trace crosses that threshold, we record that time at which that happens and then plot that value. But instead of plotting just the raw lag phase value, we add one more additional calculation. We plot the amyloid formation rate, which is just simply one over the time to threshold, which makes large values um, the faster reactions and the lower values uh, slower reactions. You can see both of those types of graphs depicted here, where on the left-hand side you have the raw thioflavin T traces, and on the right we have uh, reaction rate data, um, which has significantly more data points on it. And it doesn't look as cluttered, um, even though there are lots of data points on there. So, for example, if we were to look at all of the points on the right-hand graph in a raw data plot, it would look like this next slide. So you can see here that if looking, when looking at that amount of data in the raw format, there's just no way to interpret which line is which. And in order to visualize a large amount of data, we like to use that reaction rate value. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes telling you how to calculate that reaction rate or a lag phase in order to display more data on a single graph. So essentially what you'd like to know is when is a positive sample different than a negative sample. So if a negative sample never increases in fluorescence, a positive sample is a sample that increases in fluorescence statistically different than the negative samples. So what we've chosen to do is take an entire um, plate at the very first cycle, red, which is usually at 15 minutes, and take the fluorescent reading for each one of those wells and determine an average initial fluorescence reading. So at that point, there shouldn't be any positive reactions, so we know that all the fluorescence values should be about the same. And then we take either three or five standard deviations of that value and call that our threshold. So now when a sample crosses that threshold, that's our CT value, which is the term used in RT-PCR, and essentially that's the cycle threshold, or the cycle in which the reaction crossed the um, threshold value. And we used in the time in hours which a reaction crosses that threshold as our lag phase. And to get the lag phase, we use the MARS software program that comes with an Omega Reader uh, to determine that value. So this is what the Mars software looks like after you've opened a test run that you've completed. And you can see below there are all of the raw traces from your assay, and the red box is um, surrounding a button called Calculations. And this is where you can get the reaction rate data from. So after clicking on this box, it opens up this next box. In this Calculations window, you'll want to click on Kinetic Calculations and then change the box to Time to Threshold on the right. And then there is where you manually enter your threshold you have calculated elsewhere. Now, our thresholds are usually between 10 and 20,000, depending on the gain used, and we typically use a gain of 16 or 1800. And that gain is not set in the calculation software, it's set when you use your read program in the Omega software when you're actually recording the data. So once you've hit the apply and close button, those numbers for the lag phase will pop up below the fluorescence rating. If you don't see that, just uncheck the box that says kinetic curves. And where it says cycle, you can select the fluorescence value read at whatever cycle you would like to have. And then if you click the Excel icon next to it, that'll export all of these data into a Excel. Only export the current cycle, otherwise it'll export all 250 cycles into Excel, and that's a big mess. So there should be an Excel file with the fluorescence readings that you've chosen for whichever cycle. I usually pick the last one, and the time to threshold. Through some manipulation in Excel, you can turn those numbers into a lag phase in hours or a reaction rate by taking one divided by the lag phase in hours. So now that you've turned your raw data into reaction rates, you can then plot hundreds of different data points on a single graph without making it too busy. And this is the way I prefer to do things, and I think it makes the data a little bit easier to interpret. I've also started adding these drop bars which signifies specific times at which the reaction will be positive. So the dotted line represents 20 hours at the top, and the second dotted line represents 40 hours. And you can use these to kind of ground people to what your graphs are actually depicting. Now I'm going to spend some time telling you about the important factors in the RT quick assay. So the most important factor that I'm going to tell you about today is the production of the recombinant PRPC sensitive substrate used in the amplification process. And I'm going to give you a few tips about that. I'm also going to talk to you about reaction pH and show you some data for that. 
um, reaction temperature and how that can increase or decrease the rate of conversion. I'm going to talk a little bit about sodium chloride concentrations and a little bit about um, using SDS when you add seed to your RT quick assays. So the most important part of the RT quick assay, the most important reagent you'll be using is the recombinant PRPC that you produce in E. coli. Now this protein is expressed in inclusion bodies and needs to be solubilized by a denaturant. We use the Coagulab protocol that was developed in Rocky Mountain Labs up in Montana and they use guanidine hydrochloride to solubilize those inclusion bodies and then do an on-column binding followed by a refolding process. And that refolding process is really important. So you need a really nice instrument in order to convert the protein from the unfolded state to the folded state. Pumping 6 molar guanidine through that system does take its toll after a while. We use the GE Acta FPLC with great success and we really like that instrument for producing this protein. We predominantly use the Syrian hamster truncated protein for most of the work we do in the lab, but um, this protocol we found works well for many other types of substrates. In order to make sure that each batch of the Syrian hamster protein or whatever substrate you decide to produce is working the way you uh, would like it to, uh, we run a, at least one 96 well plate with half of the plate as a serial dilution of a positive prion brain containing seed source and another half of the plate with a negative brain homogenate that's also serially eluted. And on this slide you could see um, a number of our purifications in a row have very similar reaction kinetics from 10 to the minus 3 dilution through 10 to the minus 7. And if a batch falls out of this range uh, for the last you know, 7 or 8 batches that we've done, then we'll redo that or try to figure out what happened with that purification. We also would like to make sure that there are very few false positives in that reaction mixture. So if we see more than one false positive replicate in a half of a 96 well plate, we'll also do some sort of extra quality control to make sure that that batch is not uh, more prone to sp spontaneous conversion than the previous batches have been. For the hamster protein that we use, we typically see less than one false positive replicate out of every hundred or so negative controls we do. And anything above that, we start to look a little bit closer about that specific substrate. So one of the most important aspects of the RT quick assay is the pH of the reaction mixture. We use a pH of 7.4 in our RT quick assays with the Syrian hamster protein, and that provides us with a very low false positive rate, like I said, less than 1%. So on the right, you can see that there are three different temperatures at 45 degrees Celsius, 42 degrees Celsius, and 37 degrees Celsius, and four different pHs that we're testing, so pH 5, 6, 7, and 7.4. And along the x-axis is a serial dilution of negative brain. Now this negative brain does not have any prion seeds present, so a 10 to the minus 4 dilution and a 10 to the minus 9 dilution essentially behaves the same way. So we expected to see a flat line here. And as you can see, what does have an effect is pH 5 has an amazing false positive rate, 45 degrees, and that decreases slightly as you decrease the temperature. Um, you can also see that pH 6 and pH 7 to a certain extent also has a fairly high false positive rate. But you can see pH 7.4 at each temperature assay, even 45 degrees, has a false positive rate that's near zero. So this shows that it's really important to pH your buffers to make sure that the pH is what you think it is when after you've added your seed. It's also really important to make sure that maybe your seed is not affecting the reaction pH, which could lead to potentially more false positive reactions. Another important thing on this slide is you can see that as the temperature decreases, you also decrease the spontaneous conversion rate caused by the lower pHs. So now let's take a look at what temperature does to a seeded reaction. So here we have a serial dilution of positive prion brain from 10 to the minus 3 through 10 to the minus 7, and these were assayed at five different temperatures, 25, 30, 37, 42, and 45 degrees. And as you can see, 45 degrees has the fastest reaction rate for any of the temperatures tested, and 42 and 37 degrees have a sort of intermittent reaction rates, and 25 to 30 have very low reaction rates. And the most important thing to notice here is at 45 degrees, you see an extra log of sensitivity compared to the other temperatures, and at 25 and 30 degrees, you lose a log of sensitivity compared to 37 to 42 degrees. But between 37 and 42 degrees, the sensitivity is about the same. However, the reaction rate is a little bit slower at 37 than 42, as you would expect. So now let's take a little look at what salt concentration does in the RT quick assay. This is a graph from Jason Willem's paper that was in PLOS Pathogens, and this paper was published by the Coe Lab up in Rocky Mountain Labs. What they saw here is that between about 130 millimolar to 400 millimolar salt, there's no real difference in reaction rate. 
um, but at 500 millimolar salt there may be a slight increase in reaction rate. And there appeared to be no effect on the negative controls. So we don't typically optimize salt concentration. We have a pretty standard concentration of 300 millimolar salt and we, when we have tried to optimize it we haven't really seen a drastic effect by varying the salt concentration. I know other labs have seen more drastic effects varying salt, but we tend to stick around 300 millimolar and optimize other aspects of the RT quick assay. So outside of temperature and pH, I think the SDS concentration is one of the more critical aspects of the RT quick assay. When adding a seed to RT quick, typically you'll do a serial dilution in 0.1% SDS or in 0.05% SDS, as we've done in some of our publications. That should also be in PBS pH 7.4 to ensure that the pH remains the same in the assay. So if you're adding a lot of the seed, um, for example, 5 to 10 microliters, I would use a lower SDS concentration of 0.05%, and if you're adding 2 to 4 microliters of seed, I would use 0.1% SDS. If for some reason the seed you're adding isn't compatible with dilution in SDS, I would make sure to still add 2 microliters of either 0.1% SDS or 0.05% SDS to make sure the reaction conditions are consistent. If, for example, you're having a problem with spontaneous conversion, lowering the SDS concentration to 0.05% could potentially help with that. Or conversely, if the reaction is proceeding slowly or not particularly sensitive, I would increase the SDS concentration to 0.1%. We haven't really tested anything much above that, and adding too much SDS is a problem for this assay and will lead to more spontaneous conversion. So SDS is a really good candidate for optimization for, for each potential seed source you're trying out. So what you're trying to do by varying each one of these conditions is essentially balancing sensitivity with specificity. On this slide, what I'm depicting is how each one of these factors affects the assay. So on the left-hand side, there's increased sensitivity, which is, corresponds with faster reaction rates. And on the right-hand side, lower sensitivity corresponds with slower reaction rates. So what we would like to have is to have the unseeded reaction rate be near zero and the seeded reaction rate be as fast as possible. But typically, reaction conditions that affect the seeded reaction rate by increasing it will also increase the unseeded reaction rate. So ideally, what we would like to have is a reaction condition that both increases the seeded reaction rate and decreases the unseeded reaction rate. So now I'll tell you a little bit about how you might optimize the RT quick assay for each condition that you could try. So if you're starting out with RT quick for the first time in your lab, it's important to get a good handle on how your recombinant protein is behaving. So I would do this setup here with a couple different batches of recombinant protein to see how things are going to start with. I would start with a set of conditions that are been previously published and well established. And for us that's a reaction temperature of 42 degrees Celsius with a 700 RPM double orbital shaking. We use 0.1 mg per mil recombinant Syrian hamster 90 to 231 substrate with 20 millimolar sodium phosphate pH 7.4, 300 millimolar sodium chloride, and 10 micromolar thiophlebin T. And these conditions are very similar to what Rocky Mountain Labs started off with when they developed this assay. So another mistake we made was trying to vary too many different conditions on the same plate. So we wouldn't generate enough data to really tell if there was a substantial difference in what the conditions we were looking at. So now what I do is take a half the plate and do a serial dilution of a prion positive seed from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 8 if I'm looking at brain or other dilutions depending on the tissue. And then also a serial dilution of the negative control that I like to look at that matches the positive control that I'm, you've been using. So this will give you eight replicates of each zero dilution so you can get a good handle on your sensitivity as well as your specificity for the conditions that you're looking at. So now when you have a condition that you like to change, I would then do that on the bottom half of the plate. So now the top half of the plate is the same as your previously well-established conditions, and now the bottom half of the plate is some sort of new condition. And things I would try would be changing SDS concentration or particularly using a concentration technique such as NAPTA or a new technique we've developed, which I'll talk about next. And when you change this, look at how that compares to the original data as well as the data on this same plate. So not only could your new conditions have changed, but the conditions from the last time you did the experiment could also have changed. So that's uh, important to include the same conditions as you have previously done to ensure that something hasn't changed since the last time you did the assay. So one technique that we've been working on recently is magnetic particle extraction of prions from different biological fluids. My colleague Nate Denkers and I have recently published this paper where we use iron oxide magnetic extraction to increase the sensitivity of the RT quick assay. This technique takes advantage of the prion protein's natural affinity for metal 
and uses magnetic extraction instead of centrifugation to remove the particles with the brown prions from a solution. So, for example, if a solution was contaminated with a number of particulates, the magnetic beads could be extracted on the side of the tube and the particulates could be removed from the supernatant. So during our optimization phase for this technique, we changed a number of variables. The first one we looked at was the traditional brain homogenate diluted from a 10 to the minus 5 to a 10 to the minus 10. And that compared to the same dilutions extracted with the iron oxide mediated extraction technique. And what we saw here on top, you could see in blue, the iron oxide extracted samples had a significantly higher seeding activity compared to the normal serial diluted brain homogenate. And we could see seeding activity all the way out to 10 to the minus 9, and even a little bit of activity at 10 to the minus 10. The next thing we tried was to increase the volume of the serial dilution that we incubated with the beads. So at 10 to the minus 9 and 10 to the minus 10, with no iron oxide medi mediated extraction on the left, in black, you could see there was no seeding activity. But as we increased the volume at 10 to the minus 9 from 0.5 mils up to 2 mils, we saw an increasing amount of seeding activity, suggesting the beads, or the iron oxide particles, were extracting more prions out of the larger volume. We saw the same thing to a lesser extent at 10 to the minus 10 in yellow. So if you go back to our diagram showing the seeded reaction rate and the unseeded reaction rate, what we saw was that the iron oxide mediated extraction increased the seeded reaction rate by binding up prions in solution. And what it didn't show you here is it also decreased the unseeded reaction rate in other samples. And we think that we accomplished that by the beads extracting out prions and not some of the other potential inhibitors or factors that would increase spontaneous conversion. I'd also like to take a little bit of time to tell you about how seed concentration can be used for quantifying different amyloid seeds using the RT quick assay. I've already shown you how to calculate a lag phase or reaction rate using a cycle threshold. Um, I also hopefully convinced you that as you serially dilute a seeded reaction that the reaction rate becomes slower. And one other aspect of that is as that reaction is serially diluted, the resulting reaction rates actually fall on a linearly decreasing line. And we use this as a standard curve in order to quantify um, different prions from different tissues and bodily fluids in a paper that we published in 2015. The most important part of quantification is coming up with a robust standard curve. So in order to create a standard curve, you should repeat and have many replicates for each serial dilution that you're going to be using for the standard curve. The other important thing to consider is that your serial dilutions fall on a linear curve. If they become to look different, you could potentially have reaction inhibitors or reaction enhancers that are affecting the reaction rate and not necessarily the seed concentration. And that's exactly what we see here. This is a serial dilution of a prion positive brain from 10 to the minus 1 through 10 to the minus 8. And you can see that there's no reaction rate at 10 to the minus 1 and 10 to the minus 2 and a slower reaction rate at 10 to the minus 3. Those should technically have more prion seed than the 10 to the minus 4 reaction, but since there's an inhibitor present in brain, that decreases the reaction rate of those particular serial dilutions. So in this case, you have to dilute out that inhibiting factor until you get to a linear range of assaying the brain in order to use that as a standard curve. And on the right, we used phosphotungstic acid precipitation on the 10 to the minus 2 dilution where we saw no reaction before, after we precipitated out the prions, we see an uh, increased reaction rate similar to 10 to the minus 3, which further supports the fact that we had an inhibitor at the 10 to the minus 1 and 10 to the minus 2 dilutions. In order to further support the idea that reaction rate equated to more prions in the specific tissues we were looking at, we compared RT-quick reaction rates with a western blot of two different brains from CWD-infected deer. The DEER 776 had a high level of prions in the obex and midbrain in the western blot, as you can see. The 783 animal had low levels in the western blot for the same brain sections. When we looked at those same samples in RT-Quick, we saw that the obex and midbrain for the 776 animal, which had a high signal in the western blot, had significantly higher reaction rates and a significantly higher sensitivity in the RT-Quick assay compared to 783, which had the low western blot levels. In fact, the midbrain was still detectable in 783, and but was invisible in the western blot. 
So some of the important things to consider when attempting to quantify a sample using RTQuick is to make sure that the standard curve you're comparing it to is robust and has a lot of replicates. The other thing that's important is to make sure that each sample compared to the standard curve has most of its replicates positive because for each one of those values you'll be averaging, you want to actually have a value instead of a value of zero. You can also use a bioassay of that standard curve created with RTQuick to estimate the infectivity or lethality of a sample using RTQuick. So the RTQuick assay is really versatile. It can be used to tell whether or not a sample is positive or not, or you could take it a step further and use a reaction rate to determine how positive that sample is compared to another positive sample. So in summary, what I've told you today is the basics of amyloid amplification and how that applies to the RTQuick assay. I've shown you how to simplify your data displays using lag phase or reaction rates. I've described some of the important factors in the RTQuick assay. I've also set up a little plan on how to determine optimal reaction conditions using the RTQuick assay, or at least how we accomplish that in our lab. And I've also told you how to use lag phase or reaction rate to estimate the concentration of an amyloid seed using RTQuick. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and learned something new about RTQuick, or are at least a little bit more comfortable on how you can bring RTQuick to your laboratory to research pre diseases. Thanks for your presentation, Davin. It is now time for the Q&A. This is your opportunity to ask Carl and Davin your questions. To ask one, all you need to do is press the Ask a Question button on your console, type in your question, and then press Send. So our first question, and uh, it asks, uh, how early uh, can the assay be used to examine animals? Um, Davin, is that something that you can answer? Okay, um, so the earliest we've been able to detect um, with chronic wasting disease in deer with our most sensitive versions of the RT-Quick assay are three and four months post-inoculation, and that's with inoculation of an experimental dose. So that's that's a pretty high level of prions going into the system. Um, in a natural setting, we're not quite sure um, exactly when that would be, and, and those experiments are difficult to know because of point source exposure problems. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Excellent. I'm sure it does. And our next question asks, um, how do the substrates from different species um, affect the um, RT-Quick assay? Right. So that's a, that's a good question there. Um, there are a number of substrates used by a number of different labs, and they all seem to behave a little bit differently as far as the initial reaction rates. Um, so the Syrian hamster, the truncated form of that protein, is a fairly rapid um, substrate, um, and that usually is similar across all truncated uh, substrates. So the truncated substrates in general are faster compared to the full-length substrates. Uh, in addition, certain full-length substrates are typically more um, uh, or less likely to convert spontaneously, so they have a, they have a more stable uh, configuration. So com the white-tailed truncated protein compared to the full-length white-tailed truncated protein, the full-length one is significantly more uh, resistant to spontaneous conversion, and the truncated one is an extremely rapid substrate, um, which does have some some problems with spontaneous conversion in the later time points of the assay. So um, there's uh, the most important thing is to un is to set up a, a range where you're comfortable using the the substrate to ensure the proper sensitivity and specificity. Excellent. Thanks, Davin. And our next question is from uh, Navin. Uh, and I think he's asking um, sort of what's the problem with um, sort of detecting um, using sort of blood? Is that possible? Uh, right. So they're, they're, <laughs> this has been a, a difficult question for a number of people. Um, we've done some work on it in our lab. I was not personally doing those experiments, so I don't have a lot of experience with it myself. Okay. Um, and a number of labs have used uh, PMCA, which is another amyloid amplification assay to detect prions in blood. And in any successful case, there's typically been a step where you need to remove something from the blood, typically something like the prions um, in the best way possible. And, and people have used ultracentrifugation um, and various other techniques. And the problem with blood and amyloid amplification is twofold. Um, there is a, a substantial reaction inhibitor present in blood. So if, if a small amount of blood is added to um, any reaction that should be positive, that reaction will no longer be positive. And that can be diluted out. Um, so we know that there is an inhibitor in that reaction um, that can be diluted out, and then the positive reaction can be recovered. But um, in blood, there's a very, very strong reaction inhibitor. And conversely, <laughs> what makes it even more difficult 
is under cert- certain st- cases, there's also a spontaneous inducing agent in blood as well. So there's kind of like a double-edged sword. So not only do you get reaction inhibition, once you think you have conditions that um, are positive for blood, there are, um, there are potential for negative blood samples to also become positive for a, a reason we're not particularly sure about. Um, the, we also know there's been a number of studies that say that the concentration of prions in blood are, are very high. There's been some sheep scrapey studies saying that, you know, just uh, microliters of blood are, are enough to infect an animal. And, um, and that, is, that is very con- confounding because it is extremely difficult to detect uh, prions in blood. So that's either due to inhibitor or due to the fact that there are sub-blood samples from some diseases where the prions are at very high levels and other prion diseases, the levels in blood are very low. Now, the other thing that could be going on is that the presence of prions in blood could be extremely variable. Um, so depending on the sample, you could have one blood sample that always tests positive and is really good, but a sample from the same animal later on could always be negative, um, even though it was later in the disease course. So that's something we've also seen, and um, it's really made it extremely difficult to determine the um, the, the, met- the proper and best method for uh, determining positive reaction to blood. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, just a quick reminder to our live audience, we still uh, have time to, um, you still have time to ask a question. Uh, to ask one, all you need to do is press the ask a question button on your console, type in your question and then press send. Um, and our next question asks, um, can um, RT quick be used to analyze other uh, protein misfolding diseases? Um, yeah, I think, I think that's me again. <laughs> so, uh, so there have been a, a currently we're working on this, and I know that the Byron Coe lab up in Rocky Mountain Labs is also working on it. Um, and there's been actually a recent study using uh, alpha synuclein and, and RT quick um, detection of, of Parkinson's disease, and that was in a group out of the UK. Uh, so the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, th- there is a substantial difference between prion amyloid and its ability to seed in a in a complex reaction mix. Uh, compared to the uh, amyloid seeds and some of the other neurological diseases, there doesn't seem to be as strong of a um, uh, amyloid confirma- or a converting signal in those other types of diseases. But uh, you know, this this reaction conditions have been really really well worked out for prion disease. But um, we just I think we need to tune them to the other amyloid forming diseases. And this is a really exciting area of research. And, uh, and I know there's lots of people working on it, including us. And we're, we're pretty excited to, to try and move the technologies uh, to detect prions into the realms of other neurological diseases. So I can add a little bit to that as well. We do have um, uh, some work from a group in Germany that uh, uh, studied uh, A-beta fibrillization and aggregation using a very similar approach um, with the thioflavin T to look at, monitor the, the formation of the fibrils over time. Um, and if uh, we can share, uh, uh, we have an application note that uh, describes that that we could share if, uh, with, uh, with the, the, the person who posed the question if they, if they would like. Excellent. Thanks, Carl and Daphne. Um And our next question asks, um, is it possible to perform continuous measurements for days at a time um, without temperature variations or a break in shaking? Um, perhaps, Carl, that's something that you can um, answer? Well, the, the readings um, by necessity um, have to take a break in shaking. So um, you can't be shaking the plate and, um, and reading it at the same same time. And that's um, so that's what we have set up with our, um, our, our new approach in the Omega is to have shaking anytime there is, is, is anytime when the plate is not being read. Um, and that can be set up to run for, um, so the default is a thousand cycles. So a thousand different reads of the plate, uh, can occur. So that, um, can be stretched out for a very, you know, substantial, length of time, and I know that people have used the, the RT quick assay for up to uh, 72 hours, I believe. Um, and as far as the temperature variability, um, since it's essentially a closed system, once the, the temperature has stabilized, um, we don't see a lot of variability 
um, in the temperature in terms of what we're monitoring in the, the heating plates uh, that are that are maintaining the uh, the temperature within the reader. Excellent, thanks, Carl. And our next question asks: um, How do different uh, prion strains affect RT quick um, responses? Um, Davin, is that something that you can um, answer? Right. Um, so we've we haven't published anything on this. Um, we have briefly looked at hyper and drowsy, which are two of the most famous prion strains in as far as their um, their differences in disease course as well as their differences in um, um, stability. And and we had, we had conflicting results. We saw differences one time, and we didn't see differences another time. And that could have been just a substrate problem. Um, but that's something we're interested in looking at. It's just, it doesn't seem that there's a really robust difference. So, for example, variant um, CJD compared to sporadic CJD, we don't see any differences between those two. So um, it's not something so robust that we've said, oh, yes, we're going to work on that. But it, with the right substrate combinations, it may be possible to determine strain differences at RT quick. Absolutely. Excellent. Thanks, Devin. And our next question uh, is from Morton and asks, um, are the um, RT Quick protocols available for BMG Optima and Ferrostar plate readers? Um, Carl, perhaps that's something you can answer. Um, well, I know for a fact that um, uh, we have some users that are already using the Optima uh, software um, and the, the Optima setup uh, for for this type of assay. Um, so certainly, they are all capable of doing the same types of shaking in terms of intensity, um, and they all work within the same scripting capabilities that uh, that would allow for the, this type of assay to be performed. Um, we focused a little bit more on specializing the omega uh, for for these types of assays, uh, just because of the the popularity of the reader for for that purpose. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, and of, of course uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, the Optima is uh, is no longer a reader that is available. It has basically been replaced by the Omega. So, um, but certainly uh, the capability of uh, performing the shaking steps and um, the intermittent reading steps is 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 possible um, with any of uh, with any of our readers. Um, and my suggestion would be to contact your local sales rep and um, and. Uh, Make sure that they get you set up with uh, the the uh, script or the the assay that you you uh, would like to perform. Excellent, thanks, Carl. Uh, and our next question is from uh, Nicholas, and it asks, um, why didn't all the replicates uh, reach the same THT final signal? Um, is that something you can answer, Davin? Yeah, um, that's something we've been puzzled about for a while, and I have a couple of ideas on, on why that might be. Um, so there, there's kind of like two two separate differences. So there'll be reactions that are kind of variable between you know 10 and 20 percent or 30 percent of the total signal, um, and those those I think are just um, differences in the um, the amount of um, the substrate that could be potentially binding the well or or aggregating during the assay. So if there's some sort of early um, non-specific aggregation that happens in the assay, because these go for 24, 48, 72 hours. So if there's some non-specific aggregation that starts, that could decrease some of the potential substrate for conversion. Um, we also see phospho-T reactions that are like fourfold and max out the reader um, for fluorescence, and those are just occasionally. In a 96 volt plate, we'll see maybe one one of those out of a out of a series of 100 reactions or so, and and we think those are actually a different conformation of amyloid that might be tighter or different environment for the 5,5 T dye. So you have to remember that prions are potentially a cloud of amyloid formations, and the one that becomes dominant in the RT quick assay maybe maybe isn't you know the same every time. So there could be a specific conformation of the of that seed that drives a different conformation of the substrate, which affects the 5,5 T dye intensity. Excellent. Thanks, Devin. And just another quick reminder to our live audience, uh, you still have some time to ask a question. Um, to ask one, all you need to do is press the Ask a Question button on your console, type in your question, and then press Send. And our next question asks, um, 
Do you have any ideas of what's causing the batch-to-batch -batch differences um, of the substrates? Uh, and that question is from Lewis. Um, Davin, is that something you can answer as well? Yep, absolutely. Um, so, well, with, with the Syrian hamster substrate, our, our batch to batch variation is, is extremely low in the last few years. Um, we, we make sure we hit a certain reaction rate threshold with um, a, the exact same brain homogenate dilution we, uh, every single time. So we, we have a, a good idea that it is behaving properly. And if it's outside of that range, we don't use it. Um, but I know in early on we had batch to batch variation that was significant where some batches would have a spontaneous conversion rate that was significantly higher, or and others would be very stable. Um, others would be really fast, and others would be really slow. Um, and and that is all in dialing in the purification process. And I think the the gradient of how the protein um, is refolded is really important. Um, if there are any disruptions in the connectivity um, uh, at any point in the, in the in the purification process, then you can have a significant problem with the end uh, reaction. Um, so th this is a very difficult protein to work with, in my in my uh, opinion. We I've, I've used all sorts of proteins in in science, and this one is by far the most finicky for a purification standpoint. And that's because there's a you know an amplified direct readout of the protein. It's not like you know um, it's not used for a Western blot control or something. It's it's you know it actually has to do something and do it re um, reproducibly. So so it, it's almost if, when doing this assay, you almost need to be a go back to like a production biochemistry sort of protocol. You really have to have exact the same conditions for every purification and, and try and, and make it as reproducible as possible. But I mean, it's the best like, advice I could give. I mean, it, it basically it's just really hard, <laughs> but um, it's definitely possible. <laughs> that is the, like I said in the, in the webinar, that is the most important part of the assay and it is the most difficult thing to get dialed in. But once you have it reproducibly, um, a number of times in a row, as long as you go back to that and do it the same way, it should be fine. Absolutely. Uh, and our next question asks, um, can you recommend any uh, homogenization buffer um, that would work uh, well? Um, and um, how important is it to have um, a plate clip? Um, Davin, can you answer the first part of that question? Sure. Um, the homogen homogenization buffer is, is pretty simple. We just use um, the PBS with no detergent, so no SDS, no Triton, no nothing, and, and use mechanical homogenization. So another alternative, a lot of our alternative homogenization buffers use um, detergents to break cell membranes or do things like that, and those have a negative effect in the RT quick assay. And if you have samples in a homogenization buffer that has, like, for example, 1% Triton or 0.5% Triton X100, then um, I would seriously dilute those samples to remove as much of the detergent as possible in, in PBS and then um, run those in the Arctic Quick assay and, and making sure you always add at least you know, a little bit of the 0.1% SDS. So I would recommend not using detergents and use as mechanical of a homogenization as possible. Excellent. Um, and Carl, perhaps you can answer the, the second part of the, the question was um, sort of how important is it to have a, a plate clip? Well, since um, you, this uh, assay was done for years without a plate clip, um, it's obviously not um, absolutely vital, sure. um, but uh, um, it's certainly, we feel, a um, an advantage to um, not have to w w worry as much about the possibility of, of plates coming off. Yeah. I know that um, uh, you know they used a, a, the people that were doing this part previous to the plate clip were using a variety of approaches to to hold the uh, the plate in place um, just to make sure that um, it was not going to come off during uh, during the assay. Um, so the, it, it's. It's not vital, but we think it's a, an addition that is useful. And if you order a new reader with with that with uh, uh, for pre on detection, um, it will it will come with that provided. Excellent. And I could add a little bit to that. Yeah, sure. Go for it, Evan. Um, so the uh, we we have six readers right now that don't have plate clips, and one that does, and and we don't see any differences, at least with readout for the assay. Um, and with the plate clips, the new reader, um, I think they, they fit the plate really tightly and they're really nice. Um, I think it's just important to make sure it's, the plate is seated well into those clips um, every time. And especially if you're using different readers with different configurations, it's you know, a little bit different to put the plate in. So it's important to, to um, train people on how to do that properly.
Excellent. Thank you both. And our uh, next question asks, um, how sensitive is the assay with um, BSE and uh, VC, VC um, let me just get my uh, words out correctly, VCJD? Uh, that, you know, that would be a really good question for Byron Coe. We'll have. <laughs> um, we, we don't we don't do a lot of work with uh, BSE or variant variant CJD. Um, we have done a little bit with different substrates. Um, I'm trying to remember the conditions that Byron's lab used to get better detection with um, variant CJD versus sporadic, and I can't remember, but I know they had a paper published on that. Um, where they had some conditions that worked out uh, different. You know, that's what it was. They used the bank bowl substrate. So they used a, um, the, I don't know which bank bowl substrate, but essentially what it is, is it's a substrate problem. The variant versus the sporadic have a, don't have the same converting um, power in the Syrian hamster protein or in other substrates. So I think it's important to find a substrate that works best for those. And, and I think the Coe lab used uh, Bankful, which is kind of known as like the universal translator of, of uh, prions. And um, and I think that will help out. But there are two variations. There's an M and a V or M and an I in Bankful. Right. And there's one to use and one not to use. And I'm not sure which one it is. So I would, I would just look that up. Sure, absolutely. That's absolutely fine. And I'm sure you can sort of um, get back um, to the person that's asked the question. Um, absolutely. I'd be happy to. As well. uh, point them in the right direction uh, with the paper. Uh, and on to our next question, uh, and this is from uh, Brett. And it asks, um, can you describe how the shaking intensity, um, sort of continuous versus intermittent and linearity uh, affects the assay? Is that something that um, Carl can perhaps pick up on? Or? Um, mm -hmm. So I know that there have been quite a few groups that have done some, uh, that, that do it in slightly different ways. Um, and But it, it seems that the effect is is primarily due to, you know, primarily a, you know, kind of an activation energy uh, situation um, where um, a, a more, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, intense shake. So something that's linear that's going to, um, you know, cause it to, uh, yeah, cause the, the the samples to uh, be handled a little bit more roughly, uh, tends to cause a a more rapid uh, increase in signal. But I believe also has an effect on uh, increasing the spontaneous uh, conversion as well. So any of, any of these variations in uh, shaking intensity and shaking, um, I, I guess, form um, ha can have some uh, some differences in uh, in how the, the the actual samples respond. Um, but it, it appears to be something that is uh, translated both from uh, a seated reaction as well as a spontaneous reaction. Right. Um, I wish I could add more, but we've never changed shaking intensity from the 700 RPM double orbital, so I have, I have no idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's absolutely fine, Devin. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Uh, remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com webcasts. I would now like to thank uh, Carl Peters and Davin Henderson for their presentations and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank the webcast sponsors, BMG Lab Tech, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again for our next webcast.